Everybody struggles to learn neuroanatomy, either because they find it fascinating and want to learn everything, or because they consider it too hard and dread the tests. Given that the subject is complex, it's worthwhile to put in some time to master the general structure and learn a few tricks to make everything else much easier. This is going to be the first of four videos on neuroanatomy. Each one's content complements the others, so I recommend that you go to the channel page and watch the rest of the series. The idea of this video is that embryology determines the future organization of the nervous system and explains some anatomical relations that are at first glance very confusing. We won't have to delve into the details of molecular embryology for that. What I'm going to present is an overview of the formation of the nervous system to demonstrate some rules that govern its form and function. I promise, it'll be quick. It all starts with the zygote, one cell. It divides until the embryo takes the shape of a disc. What we're seeing here is a cross-section of the embryo at around three weeks. The disc will bend upon itself and have an outer surface, the ectoderm, and an inner surface, the endoderm. In the fourth week, the neural tube is formed. Let's go back to that disc picture so it's easier to understand. First, there is a proliferation in the ectoderm that gets thickened and forms the neural plaque. A differential growth causes these rifts and the neural sulcus. This process continues until the circle is closed and the neural tube is formed. That's it. That's the root of the central nervous system. The neural tube will give rise to the central canal of the spinal cord, the ependymal canal, and to the ventricular system of the brain. Every neuron in the central nervous system is born of the cells that line the neural tube, and it is the expansion of the tube on the cephalic pole of the embryo that turns into the brain. Basically what happens is, the neural tube dilates, forming these balloons that are called brain vesicles. Vesicle is a word from Latin that means bladder or balloon. Initially, three balloons are formed, prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and rhombencephalon, or in plainer English, forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. Thinking back of the flattened shape of the embryo, or of the horizontal posture of most animals, it's easier to understand why things that are cranial are considered anterior, and things that are caudal are considered posterior. The forebrain splits into telencephalon and diencephalon. The telencephalon is the part that covers these two balloons, later called the lateral ventricles. The diencephalon covers what becomes the third ventricle. These two structures are what will give rise to the cerebrum. The telencephalon forms the cerebral hemispheres, and the diencephalon forms the thalamus and its adjacent structures, hypothalamus, subthalamus, and epithalamus. The mesencephalon keeps its name and forms the superior part of the brainstem. The dilatation regresses and becomes a small tube again, the cerebral aqueduct. The hindbrain forms the remainder of the brainstem and the cerebellum, which are the structures that cover the fourth ventricle. The cranial part, called metencephalon, forms the pons in the front, and the cerebellum in the back, and the caudal part, the myelencephalon, gives rise to the medulla. The growth and positioning of these balloons are what create the final configuration of the structures of the brain, as we can see here. The lateral ventricles take this shape and are covered by the cerebral hemispheres. The third ventricle lies between the two and has the thalamic structures. This connects, by way of the cerebral aqueduct, to the fourth ventricle, which is covered by the brainstem and the cerebellum. It's interesting to note also that the telencephalon has such a big neuronal mass, not only because it is a balloon that has grown more, occupying much more volume and surface than the other balloons, but also because the proliferation of neurons in the cortex generates the gyri and sulci, fitting more than two-thirds of the neurons in the sulci, and only one-third is exposed on the surface. The anatomy of the brain surface, with the names of the gyri and sulci, and how to remember their positioning, is the subject of the next video, so stay tuned. Another interesting thing to mention is that there is a functional division between the anterior and the posterior parts of the central nervous system. The anterior part is associated with motor activity and the posterior part with sensory activity. This is true not only in the spinal cord with the anterior and posterior columns of neurons with these respective functions, but also in the brainstem nuclei, the thalamus, and even in the cerebral hemispheres. The frontal lobe is associated with motor activity and decision-making, whereas the parietal and occipital lobes are associated with sensory reception, information processing, and vision. This anterior-posterior relationship is easier to understand when you remember embryology and evolution. As the saying goes, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. That is, the development of the embryo shares phases with the development of the evolutionary ancestrals. In the simpler animals, such as the planarii, or even in vertebrates, such as four-legged animals, the posterior or dorsal part of the body is the part that's exposed to the external environment and receives the sensory stimuli. 
whereas the anterior or ventral part is the one that has the limbs for movement and the mouth for feeding. With that, this relationship is formed, which is conserved even in humans. Okay, that's it everybody, I hope you have enjoyed this video. In the next videos on the series we will deal with brain anatomy, cranial nerves and cranial circulation. And stay tuned to learn more about mysterious and intriguing subjects that you wish were made more clear.